Hi, so I'm Fiona Campbell uh, from um, UTS, University of Technology, Sydney. And I'm going to talk about Gertian phenomenology. Now, I was uh, originally planning to do a paper yesterday and work, uh, more of a workshop today. Because um, uh, I've got a bit of health problems, I'm only doing, I, I didn't do yet the paper yesterday. So I've actually combined the paper and the workshop together. Uh, so it's a bit of a mix, so slides and <clears throat> paper. So we'll see how we go. So I'm just going to start my slides. So workshopping Gertian phenomenology. So I'm going to look at, I'm going to present, uh, talk a little bit about what Gertian phenomenology is and also um, present the work of three Gertian phenomenologists, two of them scientists, and, and uh, the third one is myself. <coughs> Sorry about the coughing. So, just to uh, get a little context here. If like me, in the over the summer, you probably downloaded an awful lot of apps, apps about uh, warning us about all kinds of emergency situations, about the fires, flood, severe storm, hail, smoke, all these things that we were constantly checking on in order to see how we how they were going to affect our day and our lives and our um, physical and mental health. And what we really saw um, <clears throat> ramping up here was this increasing fear of nature, of nature as the enemy. And for instance, there's even a film, a documentary that was made last year called Bushfire Wars, where you see that um, it follows a dedicated team of firefighters. They wage a relentless battle against a completely unpredictable enemy. So we see this um, conceptualization of nature as increasingly as something other than ourselves, as this enemy that we uh, need to combat. And of course, we're seeing this more and more in the news media, particularly uh, in relation to um, anything that threatens this same frame of reference of any use for anything outside of the man-made world that might hit, uh, threaten human hegemony. Hege Sorry, hegemon. Oh, sorry, human dominance. Sorry. <clears throat> so, and of course, we're seeing this also with the COVID nineteen pandemic. But there's another side to uh, seeing nature as an enemy, and that is apart from seeing nature as a kind of a general being beneficial for us when we go out into nature. There's also this picture of nature as entertainment, and Nature is something that provides us in our leisure time with interest and entertainment and nature particularly, and you can see this all over social media, as something that is cute. Now, a couple of months ago, uh, I think it was just before Christmas, I came across on my social media account this um, slide. No, it was actually a video, I should say, about uh, cutest baby sloth ever, and it was showing this little baby sloth um, in the arms of a zookeeper being shown, you know, and it was, I think it was done, it was, a, it was done as a scientific documentary, but the whole tenor was about, oh, look at how cute, oh, isn't it cute that he's raising his claws in this way, isn't it cute, oh, look, he's trying to high five me. And I saw this, and I actually felt such a shock my shock and dissociation upon seeing this video came because I'd just come from uh, spending months of immersion into, the, into reading about sloths by a Gertian scientist called Mark Holdridge, who uh, brought us a picture of the sloth in its natural environment where every detail, every quality described, he says, speaks of the sloth, of slothness. And I had built up over this time this imaginative picture of the sloth as being completely at one with it in its environment to the point of seeing it out of its environment and being only displayed for entertainment purposes felt like a shock of complete wrongness. It wasn't 
uh, a moral judgment. It wasn't a feeling of, oh, you know, this could be harmful or it should be, be treated in this way. It was simply uh, a sense of wrongness and that I actually felt this is wrong. And this one can say these concepts such as cuteness and enemy are extensions of this separation of the human from the world that an analytic science view of the world has brought to us to. Neil stated yesterday that Husserl uh, argued that um, objectivity arose out of subjectivity. And you might say this happens when we uh, step back from the world rather than towards it. We bring about this separation of the subjectivity of being in the world and we bring objectivity by stepping away from the world. And this is what I think that, um, or I decided perhaps that Stuart was talking about yesterday when he talked about the ungroundable facts of science, that they are literally, when one steps away from the world, they are literally not grounded in the world. So how can it be different? In Goethean science, or in phenomenology, which is Goethean science is a phenomenological approach. Unlike in theory building methodologies, the aim is to bring oneself closer to the phenomenon as directly as possible, rather than stepping back from it to objectively, objectively observe it. When we step closer to the world, we become, as Goethe says, at home with it through a process of observation, repeated observations, where we immerse ourselves in the phenomenon of the other in order to learn to know its qualities, a process that is one of gradual disclosure that leads us to the phenomenon's essential being. Goethean phenomenology is in fact a qualitative, not a quantitative approach to science, aimed at providing an epistemological rather than ontological understanding of the phenomenon. It was originally directed towards science rather than psychology, towards nature rather than humans. But like traditional phenomenology, it emphasizes immersion in the world through direct experiential contact, through observation. But for Goethe, observation is not what we think of as an everyday scene, but a type of beholding, a, a term that he uses in the sense of contemplating receptively. Beholding goes beyond ordinary observation to a perceptual encounter that reveals the patterns or essence of the phenomenon, like a seeing of the mind, Holdridge uh, describes it. It is an unfolding observational process of nature, one that aims at understanding and not at explanation. Not at ex not of explanation and not of reduction either. Goethe, in a sense, foreshadowed Merleau-Ponty by emphasizing perception as being primary to this approach, as a way of disclosing the world through developing new eyes for it. Through beholding the world, we can, as Goethe says, become utterly identical with the object. A well-known example of this, uh, often cited in uh, non-phenomenological um, non, uh, non works, is the, um, that of geneticist Barbara McClintock, who won a Nobel Prize for her work on uh, corn chromosomes. And she described experiencing a similar sort of intimacy as Goethe describes after long hours spent studying chrome, corn, chrome, chrome, corn chromosomes through a microscope, an experience she described as leading to a develop of a kind of intuitive thinking in her. And there was the basis of her Nobel Prize winning work. This interpenetration of self and world leads to a restructuring of consciousness, says Goethe. And inter this interpenetration of self and world leads, sorry, I just read that, to a transformation through phenomenological seeing and experiencing. Merleau-Ponty similarly hinted at consciousness being restructured through his concept of radical reflection, a notion that approaches that, you know, some ways of that of the Eastern contemplative tradition, where consciousness itself is not only a directed towards the phenomenon, but is shaped or even transformed by it. In this way, the duality of the mind-body distinction is then dissolved. 
although Gertian phenomenology orient, orients to the study of nature, not to humans, um, Robbins considers that the Gertian approach, in fact, closes the gap between these two fields, as its approach to observation is also a path of self-discovery for the researcher. Its particular significance in this broader context is that it provides an enlightening understanding of the direct experience, in fact, of how to capture it more directly. To do this, one must go back upstream, as Henry Bortoff calls it, back upstream into the experiencing of the experience, into the appearing of the appearance. Phenomenology here, therefore, shifts the attention from within the experience, from what is experienced downstream, back into the experiencing of what is experienced, says Bortoff. The phenomenon is not only something that appears, but it appears as appearing. Being means appearing, says Heidegger, meaning not what appears, but upstream of what appears within the happening of the appearing. In this way, seeing becomes a coming into being experience of a phenomenon. The phenomenon then is experienced as a dynamic unfolding event, not something that is already past and fixed. So what I want to do now is look at a couple of particular examples of Gertian phenomenology in, in practice. So the first one, so Neil, I think uh, this morning in his paper looked at the plant world. So I want to look at uh, two phenomenological studies on the animal and on the human world. So let's return to the slop. So this is a drawing by uh, the Gertian scientist, Mark Holdridge in his, in um, uh, uh, illustrating his description of the, his phenomenological studies into the slop. And this is, as it says, uh, the three, uh, the three toed slop, where one can see the slop as a picture of the organic lawfulness inherent in one animal. So, Holdridge provides in his description a very long, complex, very detailed um, account of the sloth, but the sloth in its world and not separate from it. So it talks, he talks about the fur that turns green in places where the algae, it picks up algae and algae starts to grow in its fur. It talks about the limbs on which, from which its body hangs because it lives, it is basically uh, an animal that must live in the trees. It talks about its temperature, its diet, its metabolism, its trademark slow, slow movement. Holdridge notes that the sloth is so particularly blends with its environment through its colours and movements, and also through its changing uh, bodily temperature, which changes in accordance, not through its own activity, but in accordance with the ambient temperature of its environments. And that so in this way that the sloth cannot be understood truly understood as separate from its environment. And it is not that the sloth is, uh, he says, is slow so much that it stretches time. Even its feces decompose incredibly slowly, providing a slow, gradual source of nutrition for the forest, for, for, uh, the, from the ground and into the forest. So the sloth in its habitat is a habitat in itself. Apart from the usual mites, fleas and beetles, there's a special type of moth that lives in its fur. They are not parasitic, they get their food elsewhere, and the algae lives in its fur. So the sloth is an environment in itself, but one so intimately connected with the forest that, so in tune with it, that taken out of its habitat, as I saw in this video, and in all the cute sloth social media accounts, that when taken out of its environment, you take away its essential slothness. There's some um, excerpts from his description where of the sloth. Um, and what happens when the sloth isn't in its natural terrestrial <coughs> environment, but on rough surfaces and in captivity and in people's homes when they keep pet sloth, it's actually 
uh, extremely difficult, in fact, for the sloth to crawl along. So, as it says, the sloth can only drag its body in finding a hole for its claws. And because the sloth, in its, in its uh, true environment, is essentially a, um, an animal that spends its whole life in the trees, hanging from the branches. Even the way its fur, even its fur tells us that have a part, instead of having a part on the mid-back, with the hair running towards the belly, as is typical with terrestrial animals, the sloth's fur has a part mid-belly and the hair runs back towards the back. So viewed in this way, the sloth tree, sloth moth and the algae are all part of one another. So this picture that Holdridge paints, this picture of the sloth in the context of environment, he says that the whole lights up through the parts. And as Bortoff says, the way to the whole is into, is through the parts. The whole is nowhere to be encountered except in the midst of its parts. And these parts in the sloth are completely integrated with its environment. So, as I said, this uh, having immersed myself in this description of the sloth over several months, where I'd filmed this inner picture of sloth and as being completely one in the forest, that this has just then my uh, explains my sense of wrongness when I saw the sloth and taken out of its environment. Um, it had lost something of that essential being. So I want to now look at another example of phenomenological studies. So I want to look at, uh, bring to you briefly, something about the application of Gertian phenomenology to the human world, starting, however, with the work of another Gertian scientist called uh, Theodor Schwenk um, and his work on qualitative natural water flow studies, which I uh, actually used as a launching pad for my own uh, phenomenological study for my doctoral dissertation on thinking, um, which was particularly focused on the nature of the experience of thinking during creative activity. So when we look at this verse in his, um, in his book on his studies, Theodor Schwenk says the activity is thinking is essentially an expression of flowing movement. Only when thinking dwells on a particular content, a particular form, does it order itself accordingly and create an idea. Every idea, like every organic form, arises from a process of flow until the movement congeals into a form. Therefore, we speak of a capacity to think fluently when someone is skillfully able to carry out this creation of form in thought, harmoniously coordinating the stream of thoughts and progressing from one idea to the other. Thinking that cannot enter deeply enough into every detail becomes in fact a flight of ideas torn along as though by an invisible torrent which can create no permanent forms. On the other hand, thinking that becomes solidified in fixed ideas remains captive of form without being able to develop towards uh, further possibilities. So this imaginative metaphor uh, of thinking, which in fact to shrink wasn't in fact a metaphor at all, but in fact uh, a reality. From this one, um, uh, Schwenk was inspired by his, uh, by he was this sorry this this imaginative picture, this kind of a shape of the of the way of um, of thinking in a dynamic form was inspired by his qualitative investigation into natural water flow. His studies revealed that the form of water in the natural environment has an intrinsic ebb and flow that is more than simply a flow of energy. It has an expressive curvilinear gestures such that meander, spiral and oscillate, and yet a rhythm that is following a law towards the spherical shape of the water droplet. But his analogy of water flow with thinking is more than just poetic. He, as I said, he based this aesthetic and imagery on his meticulous experimentation and phenomenological observation of water processes in nature imbuing his empirical methods with this metaphoric imagination, 
that arose from his, uh, his descriptions or from immersing himself in the, his observations of water flow. The foundation of this <clears throat> concept is that the activity of thinking has the same meander gesture as water flow. In water, natural forms arrive out of weaving strands of flowing movement. Sorry. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> they are shaped by water's intrinsic dynamic interplay with external constraints such as rocks, twigs, the banks of a river that act as a resisting force, resulting in one complex, multi-stranded dynamic movement such as one, um, so this is a this illust this um, is a photo of one of his experiments of drawing a sharp object through um, oil in water, and these are the forms that in fact are left afterwards. So this is uh, the as one not only then one must say that this is um, shows the picture of natural water flow, but it also this is. The, the visual uh, image of how Schenk conceptualized dynamic thinking. So in the same way, thought forms, ideas, gradually arise in the process of our thinking, says Schenk, due to the tension that arises through a similar dissolve and bind process as we think. This presents us with an experiential picture of thinking process as an ever evolving stream of flow and resistance that embodies both order and chaos, continuity and discontinuity. Our thinking when in full flow should in fact be experienced as this dynamic living streaming movement active in our inner being. So conceptualizing thinking in terms of uh, fluidity is however, not unique to Schwenk. We're all familiar with the phrases like the flow of thought within the stream of consciousness. But Schwenk deepened and extended this uh, picture when through his uh, qualitative water experiments, he demonstrated that nature exists as one whole being and human thinking when enlivened through immersive repeated beholdings when our perception is enlivened when we step closer to the world rather than away from it, can connect us to this being of nature and be part of it. Schenck's descriptive lived experience understanding of how we think and process our ideas demonstrates a far more integrated understanding of human thinker, thinking than traditional science, which takes a dualist stance to cognition and in fact to um, the human being itself. Seeking to explain cognition in isolation from general human experience, separating thinking into types such as the intuitive versus logical or critical versus creative. Further, such dualistic approaches characterize the structure of thinking as a step process in a line of thought. By contrast, Schwenk's image of thinking is a dynamic, continually recursive, multi-stranded, interplay of two opposing forces of interaction, sees the quality of thinking's movement with its multi-string thickness as important as the structure of the thinking itself. His holistic position sees cognition as part of human experience rather than being distinct from it, seeing the parts, always presencing the whole. Schwenk saw the human being as dynamically interacting with the world through perception, cognition and experience in ways that cannot be abstracted into theory. I'd just like to say at this point that Schwenk's conception of thinking as an experience of uh, flow and resistance was clearly de demonstrated in my doctoral thesis in my, in when I looked at the uh, phenomenological study of cognitive processing during dynamic activity. In my research, I uh, wanted to not just take a closer look at um, uh, a very popular theory of um, think of creativity called flow thinking. I not only wanted to take a closer look at that in relation to uh, the concept of creativity, but to look at it in relationship to the way people thinking and processing as they create, as they engage in the process. 
So not just their thoughts about it afterwards, not just their recollections of the experience, which often become as stories they uh, have um, tell about themselves in interviews that they have woven their memories into. But I wanted to actually look at the appearing of those thoughts and feelings as they happened. And just as Schenk took a uh, closer look at the qualities of water through observation and experiment, so I looked very closely at what people were actually experiencing in their experiencing as they were creating. Furthermore, to do this, I used Bortoff's approach of going back upstream, so to speak, from the experience to try to capture the direct experience in its appearing in order to understand what actually was the experience in its experience as it appeared. So thinking when enlivened by the seeing with the mind's eye that Goethe called beholding can be in fact a dynamic experience with the capacity to um, revive and disrupt, dissolve and bind the underlying patterns that govern our habitual patterns of thought processing. In this way, we can not only experience our thinking process in connection with the dynamic living world around us, but it means we are open and cognizant to what the world is speaking to us. And then I've just, as um, <clears throat> the philosopher Rudolf Steiner says, as Lo, who was a Goethe scholar, as long as a person does not feel the working and creating of an idea, his thinking will always remain separate from nature. <clears throat> so, to conclude this presentation, so having given those two those different examples of the application of Goethean phenomenology to the animal world, to water flow, and um, very briefly, though I didn't really go into it, to my work on the um, practice of, on the experience of cognitive processing. I'd just like to draw um, attention to how Goethean phenomenology could also act as a cultural therapeutic. So, the, and this work comes in fact from a psychologist, uh, Brent Dean Robbins, who was very inspired by Goethe's uh, approach to observing and understanding nature. Robbins says that the aim of a cultural therapeutic is to own up to our obligations that which is in unconscious but continues to claim us in our technological world. It is a matter of making explicit those responses to the world that are covered over or concealed by layers of culture, which, were, which nevertheless continue to call us and which um, remain accessible only through careful, critically engaged description of a phenomenon. The process of owning up to our obligations is one that can be a healing process a process of coming home to ourselves, as Goethe might have said, in, in this way it is therapeutic. So Goethe's method of science is a form, he says, a cultural therapeutic, because it offers arguably not only a different approach to science than modern science, but it offers a style of understanding nature that is therapeutic. And when one says that Goethe offers a therapeutic note, approach to nature, what he means is that his, the process of studying nature is one that is potentially transformative for the researcher, for the scientist, for the observer. This is not an approach to nature which says that being in nature is good for me because of how it makes me feel, but one where we learn to perceive the beingness of nature through this process of stepping closer to it and learning its secrets. It is a therapeutic process because it is one that may potentially restore to health and wholeness those who would practice it. It is a cultural therapeutic because it had taken up as a cultural practice and as a cultural worldview, it may in fact be curative and restorative for our entire culture. There is no question that for Goethe, observation or beholding as he called it, has in its aim the development of the observer who in the process of clear and careful description of the object under investigation is in the process of schooling their own faculties. So Goethean phenomenology then can close the gap between natural science and the humanities. It's both come to share the task of schooling our faculties. 
and cultivating understanding. So the natural sciences and the human sciences can become united because the observ observation of nature is always, or should always be a process of self-discovery. And through that self-discovery, we may come better to realize more sustainable practices of living with nature and with each other. So just to finish, I'd just, just like to leave you with uh, something from Merleau Ponty. In his last unfinished work, Merleau Ponty extends the human centered being towards a being that entwines with the natural world when he begins calling unreflected experience the brute or wild being that can never be fully articulated, never be fully expressed, never captured in its essence. And yet, the phenomenologist must always aim towards that, towards capturing that which cannot be captured. For Merleau Ponty, being becomes a thing which has yet to attain the status of an object and yet cannot do so. This increasing awareness of the unresolvable contradiction inherent in a phenomenological approach suggests a much more radical response than perhaps the um, more scientific transcendental approach of Husserl and his interpreters and very far from the everyday life worlds of hermeneutic phenomenologists. Because it hints at silence, at ineffability, at something right at the edge of what can be humanly expressed or even grasped. For Merleau Ponty, language becomes not only the voice of humans, but the very voice of things, the waves and the forests, that the world itself has agency and its own intentions that call upon us to respond, draws a certain parallel with this belief of Merleau Ponty's that in the, this belief that lang in language is the very voice of things. Thank you. Any comments? Thank you, Fiona, that was wonderful. I, I really, I really loved that. I, I was so much food for thought and to the what comes to me straight away is really involving oneself in the process as and you pointed out right at the beginning with that so-called cute slows it that actually distances one from the life of creatures and yeah thank you Thanks. I think that had so, has so many implications for phenomenology and my own area of people with dementia. I, I think that picture of the sloth really speaks to me because it's what we do where, with people when they have dementia as well. Oh, we, okay. don't, we don't live into their world. We don't try to find to seek the phenomena and to really observe what's happening for those people. So it's a very valuable insight for me. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I like, I really, I like the comparison between the two ways of thinking about the sloth. That was fantastic. 